I want to pull on this guy. Remember this guy? We put this big box around it. It is the relationship between A, B, and the eccentricity. Okay? And we're going to unlock why eccentricity is called eccentricity. Okay? Now, do you remember? We've only seen a very small number of values for E, right? We started off with E equals 1, right? That was actually where the game began before we even knew it was called eccentricity. If E equals 1, if the ratio between the distance to the focus and the distance to the directory. If that ratio is 1, then the shape we get, of course, is our parabola, parabola right? Oops. That's PS. <coughs> okay. And then we just mucked around with a few other values, right? So we tried a half, we got this awkward 0 0.661 whatever value, and we ended up with ellipses, okay? So now I want to try and understand, well, can I do better than just like trying to pluck in random values and seeing what happens? And I can, right? Um, those values that we mentioned before, they were all less than one. Less than one. But by definition, because what you are comparing is a length and a length, they're all positive. Does that make sense? So I kind of know, at least in this kind of scheme here, I'm less than one, and every ellipse you find will be less than one, but I'm also above zero, right? So I've got, got this like little sweet spot in here that's, that's behaving in this unusual way. Now, I have to say between, because if I say eccentricity equals zero, kind of math breaks, right? Because what is eccentricity? How do I introduce it? It's a ratio. It's a ratio. It's a ratio. You can't have a ratio between two things that's zero. I don't care how big or small any of them are. A ratio of zero doesn't make sense, okay? If only we had a kind of mathematics that could deal with, like, trying to get to an actual number when you can't put the actual number in. Only I had a tool that was good at doing that. Oh wait, I do. They're called limits, right? Limits. Limits are exactly what we introduce when it's like, I can't do rise over one where there's no run. And you can't have a ratio between two things where there's no ratio, okay? But I can examine what happens as it gets closer and closer and closer. And doing that the first time gave us calculus, right? So let's see what this is gonna give us, right? What happens to this? What is happening to b squared as I take the limit as e approaches zero? Okay, have a look at this. Um, the limit as e approaches zero of this is the limit as e approaches zero of this. They're the same thing, right? So this is the limit as e approaches zero of a squared, one minus e squared. And the lovely, beautiful thing about this is that just like with our algebraic manipulation of first principles, I can put e equals zero straight into it. I can just substitute it in. What do I get? I get a squared times one, which is a squared. Wait, what? What does yeah. that mean? What does that mean? What's just happened, right? The algebra makes sense. The algebra makes sense. Like zero there, one minus zero is one. So that it has to be that. But what does it mean? It's a circle. Well, if b squared becomes a squared, then this, this is not your equation anymore. You get this, right? And now it makes sense, I can just multiply the whole thing through by a squared, and I will get, now hold on a second, what's a? What's a on my, on my list? It's the length of this um, semi-major axis, you remember that? So that point right there is a, do you agree with that? Or a comma zero. So where is that? And the answer is it's here. It's a circle. It's a circle with the same width across here as the major axis of my ellipse, okay? Now this circle is really important. It's so important it gets a name. It's called the auxiliary circle. It's like the circle just sitting on the outside of this ellipse, okay? Now what if we just established when eccentricity, if it could equal zero, you get a circle. Circle? Circles. Whispering galleries, ellipses, parabolic reflectors, they're all in the same family. And now I can tell you why eccentricity is called eccentricity. Um, when you say centric, right, like geocentric or heliocentric, what does centric mean? Middle. It means the center, right? Like the center, middle. Okay. Now, unfortunately, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of English spelling that um, we have done this way. This, you know the way I'm saying it, eccentricity? A better way to spell it would be X 
eccentricity. That's actually the way that we say it. And that's the root of the word where it comes from. When you put X on top of, in front of something, what does that mean? Like exterior. What does that mean? Yeah, it means outside. It means away from, right? External, exterior, right? Right? So do you remember I said to you, oh, an ellipse, it's got two foci. It's as if the center of the circle got broken in half and kind of migrated away, away from the center. Right? Now the further they migrate, the more of a stretched out ellipse you get because those centers get really, really far apart. You get a highly eccentric ellipse, right? And you remember I was talking about the path of the sun through the Earth? Anyone who's actually studied like astronomy, they talk about the eccentricity of the orbit of a comet or a planet or a moon or whatever. What they're talking about is, how close is it, or how far is it, from being a perfectly circular orbit? So a comet, for instance. Comets, we only see them, you know, every few decades, right? That's because we have an orbit kind of like this, but a comet has an orbit like this, right? It spends all this time all the way over here, and then seven years later, how this comet turns up again, right? Because it has a highly eccentric orbit. This is the language we get. Think about this, right? As the eccentricity increases, what happens as... Oh, I'll use this space. What happens as E approaches 1? What happens to that? What's it getting? Well, you get limit as E approaches 1 of A squared, 1 take away E squared. So that thing is approaching 1. It's approaching 1 take away 1. This thing is going to 0, right? So B squared, like this actually doesn't make sense because it's on a denominator, right? But I know the smaller this value gets, like B represents these two values, right? So B is getting smaller and smaller. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more eccentric, okay? Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer just yet, but I will tease it, right? If you think about this, because we've looked at, we've looked at zero, I know what that means. We looked at between zero and one. I know what that means. It's these ellipses, and I, we already started with one. The obvious question is, what happens when you pass one? Well, watch this, right? When e is greater than one, what do we know about b squared? Look at it, right? Remember, b squared is a squared times one minus e squared. If e squared is bigger than one, what happens to this guy? He's negative. Oh, that's why it flips on this side. Now, remembering that b is a length, and we're squaring it, and apparently we're getting something negative, okay? This tells us that whatever it is, it's something quite different entirely, and we will meet it next week, okay? We will meet it next week, but there's nothing stopping you. Remember I said, hey, let's just experiment with this. Let's just, let's just see what happens. Okay. The balls, right? Pick a value, any eccentricity you like, bigger than one, you pop it into the locus definition and see what jumps out at you, okay? We will meet it as a class on Monday.